This is Pascal's triangle. It's created by putting ones all along the outside of the triangle, and then for the inside, like for example this pink one up here at the top, you're going to add up the values directly above it, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. Or if I look at this spot, then 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, 2 plus 1 is equal to 3, 1 plus 3, last time I checked, was equal to 4, and so on. That construction of always taking the two values above it and add them create Pascal's triangle. Now, Pascal's triangle has all sorts of really cool properties, like just one of them, for example, is that the sum of the values on every row is just a power of 2. But the reason I'm showing you Pascal's triangle is because of its connection to the topic of this video, which is powers of binomials. Let's take just for example the, I don't know, sixth row just so we can have it here and take a look at it. And I'm going to compare this to the expansion of x plus y to the power of 6. Now, I could try to expand this by hand, but I'd probably make a mistake and I really don't want to, so I'm going to turn to a calculator to help me out. I'm going to go x plus y to the power of 6, and if I come down here and click the expand button, what I see is the expansion of x plus y to the power of 6. And those exact numbers from Pascal's triangle are appearing as the coefficients of this expansion, 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, and 1. This app that I'm using, by the way, is the sponsor of today's video, which is Maple Calculator, and you can check out the link down in the description if you want to check it out yourself. So in this video, I really want to do two things. The first is that I want to explore these powers of binomials. We're going to see the connection to Pascal's triangle, and we're going to see something called the binomial theorem. But then I want to go further. Instead of x plus y to the sixth, let's say if I put x plus y to the, oh, I don't know, maybe to the power of pi. Well, now I have a problem because I actually don't know what algebra I could do to solve that. In fact, in Maple Calculator, I don't even see an expand button because you cannot expand this as a finite polynomial. So I'm also going to have to answer the question of how do I move beyond the binomial theorem to something called binomial series? Let me make the connection between these powers of binomials and Pascal's triangle more explicit. The first power would be x plus 1 to the power of 0, and something to the power of 0, unless it's 0 itself, is just 1. Note, I'm going to be expanding x plus 1 opposed to x plus y, so you can imagine y is being substituted in as 1. It doesn't really matter too much. Then I can take x plus 1 to the 1, which is just 1x plus 1, I'm not doing anything, but the first one that's sort of interesting is x plus 1 squared. Expand that out and you get 1x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now let me go one further, I'm going to do x plus 1 cubed. So let's think about how x plus 1 cubed looked like. x plus 1 cubed is like x plus 1 squared times one more copy of x plus 1. In other words, it's this thing I already have, the x squared plus 2x plus 1, times x, and then you add to it that same thing times 1 by distributivity. So I can write this as sort of two lines. I'm going to first multiply everything by x, gives me x cubed plus 2x squared plus 1x. And then I'm also going to multiply one time it, which is just going to copy and paste it, 1x squared plus 2x plus 1. Now if I add like terms together, I get exactly that phenomenon that we had in Pascal's triangle, where you're like 2 plus 1 comes together to form a 3. This can be cleaned up as x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. But let's do it one more time just to see the pattern. x plus 1 to the fourth. I'll multiply everything that we had for x plus 1 cubed times an x. Then I'm going to multiply everything from x plus 1 cubed just times 1. I add them together in the same way, and you see that for the like terms, you have a 3 plus 1, a 3 plus 3, another 1 plus 3. And this gives me this pattern with coefficients 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. If I remind myself of what Pascal's triangle was, that was exactly it. 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. That was the row of Pascal's triangle. So the point is, the rows of Pascal's triangle give you the coefficients when you expand these binomials. It's wonderful. But maybe you don't want to compute Pascal's triangle every time, particularly for large values of these powers. So I want to show you another combinatorical way that you can get to this. So what I want to do is I'm going to do x plus y to the fifth. So I put up five copies of x plus y. I'm trying to think, like, what would be the coefficient of, say, I don't know, the x cubed y squared term, or any other term that you so chose? Well, by distributivity, I'm multiplying all these factors together. And basically, if it's going to be x cubed, you'll have had to choose from those five factors, you'll have had to choose the x three times. Maybe something like this. I'll choose the x in the first, third, and fourth factor, and the y's in the second and the fifth. This is just one choice, right? There's multiple ones. I could choose, for example, this other choice as well. But it has to be, of the five factors, you're choosing three of those to be an x, and two of those to be a y. And as soon as I phrase it like this, that combinatorial process of, well, five, choose three, may come to mind. So the symbology we use for this coefficient is five, choose three, 
is defined to be 5 factorial over 3 factorial times 5 minus 3 factorial. If you're unsure about this formula and this notation, I'll put up a link to a previous video I've done introducing that entire idea. So here we have the coefficient of one of these terms, and now we can figure out what everything is going to be. This is the binomial theorem, and it says that if you take x plus y to the power of n, and just some positive integer, then it's just a sum of all the possible terms that can look like x to some power and y to some power, with the coefficient always being n choose k. And this should hopefully make some sense. For example, if we plug in k equal to n here, so that's saying you just have x to the n and, and y to the zero, which is just one, there's only one way to make that happen. That's when you choose x in every one of those factors. Again, I can just take y equal to one and get this format for binomial theorem. You, you might see it both ways. But let's go back to that fun Pascal's triangle thing about all the sums of the triangles being two to a power. Why is that true in our combinatorial approach? Well, if I go and look at our x plus y to the power of five again, the total number of possibilities is for each one of these binomials, there's two possibilities. So there's two to the five total possible terms, and so we've resolved that mystery as well. But this binomial theorem, as I've said it so far, is very restricted about the n. n really is a positive integer here. It can't be pi, it can't be one half, it can't be negative one, nothing like that. Or could it be? Like, if I wanted to define x plus 1 to the alpha, where alpha was just some arbitrary real number, or indeed even a complex number if you wished, could I do that too? Could I come up with some sort of analogous series to this formula that I have for the binomial theorem? Now one thing in the binomial theorem I think I can do nicely, that's that n choose k portion. So okay, let's zoom in on that. n choose k was defined to be n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial. And the n factorial over n minus k factorial, if you expand all those out, so the n factorial on the top is like n, n minus 1, dot, 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 all the way down to 3, 2, 1. So if you divide out by n minus k factorial, which looks like n minus k times n minus k minus 1, dot, 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 3, 2, 1, that sort of cancels all those factors at the tail. And so this is the same thing as saying n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, all the way down to the final one that survives is n minus k plus 1, and then divided by k factorial on the bottom. Now that I've done this, now that I've said it this way, where I've got rid of factorials that you might think of as factorials or things for positive integers, well, the n doesn't have to be a positive integer here. I could define alpha choose k, this, this new notation, to be the exact same thing here. And if alpha is a half, it would be like a half times minus a half times minus three halves and so forth. This is perfectly fine for generalizing the idea to an arbitrary real number. I mean, heck, you could even have alpha equal to zero and the whole thing would be equal to zero. So, okay, so going back to our tension, we sort of maybe solved the n choose k part. That we can replace, but we still have the issue that this is a finite sum because for, before there was sort of like a, a fixed number of terms and, and we were really having this limit of the final thing being an n. So if I want to replace this for an arbitrary alpha that has no sort of natural stopping spot when you start subtracting one from it, what should I do with that? So the next thing I want to do is remind you about an incredibly powerful theorem from calculus, perhaps one of the most important theorems from calculus, Taylor series. The big idea of Taylor's theorem is to take a function and approximate it by a polynomial with more and more and more terms. Let me show you what I mean. Here I put the function sine of x in, and you can see this nice plot of sine of x. Then the first two terms of Taylor's series give what's called a linear approximation. This is what I've written here when I say the function value at zero plus its derivative at zero times x. If I include this in my plot, then what you see is that this linear approximation is a good approximation near zero, even though it fails to be far away from zero. Now, the next expression, g double prime, just happens to be zero, so it doesn't improve anything, but the following one, which goes all the way up to a g triple prime term, if I include that in the plot, now you see that I have this really nice cubic that is just a better approximation to the original sine of x than just the linear ones. And going all the way down to the fifth order approximation, including that in the plot as well, you get this purple curve and this quintic polynomial is yet a better approximation for the original sine of x. The software I'm using to make this sort of mathematical document is Maple Learn, the same people that made Maple Calculator. The links to both of those are down in the description. What I really want to do is the powers of binomials, so I've come and put in f of x is 1 plus x to the fifth, and as I take the first, second, third, and fourth derivatives, notice the pattern. 
Five, ten, ten, five. Exactly the pattern we've been seeing in Pascal's triangle. Okay, so let's actually compute the Taylor series in our specific example where we've got our function and it's x plus one to the alpha, alpha, a real number. First derivative, the alpha comes out the front and it now becomes alpha minus one. Second derivative, it's now alpha times alpha minus one out the front. And generally in the kth derivative, put brackets in here with the k to say this is not the kth power, this is the kth derivative. Either way, it's alpha, alpha minus one, all the way down to alpha minus k plus one times the x plus one to the alpha minus k. Now notice in the Taylor's formula here, it's the kth derivative at a point a, and typically the a that I choose is a equal to zero. That is, we're centering our Taylor series around zero, and I'm gonna do that as well. I'm just gonna plug in, everywhere there's an x, I'm gonna plug it in to be zero here. So that just really simplifies what I have for my expressions. I'm doing good. I still have a divided by k factorial I need to do, so let me divide out by my k factorial. And then that expression, We've seen that before. That was how I defined that alpha choose k notation, the sort of extension of the normal integer n choose k notation. So now I know what my coefficients are and I can say what is the binomial series. x plus one to the alpha is the sum from zero all the way to infinity now of this alpha choose k, x to the k, and this is true when x is between minus one and one. Now to get a better sense of these series, let's do one plus x to, oh, I don't know, how about 0 0.5? And what Maple Learn does is it pops up this nice little sort of context menu of operations you might want to do. And as I've noted, clicking the expand button isn't gonna do anything to it because there's no nice algebra that I can do when it's raised to the power of a half. But if I come down here and click the series centered at zero, that's exactly the binomial series then you can see the nice expansion I get. One plus a half minus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on. These are the terms that you get from that funky alpha choose n business that we've seen before. I could do other ones. Let me, the last one I'm gonna do is one plus x to the power of minus one. This is kind of a fun one. And clicking on the series button, what you see is I get this nice behavior, minus one plus one, minus one plus one, minus one and so forth. And that should sort of make sense, because if I think about the derivative to the power of minus one, it's gonna bring a minus one down, then a minus two, then a minus three, then minus four, then minus five. That's exactly gonna cancel the factorials that you had on the bottom, except for whether there's an even or an odd number of minus signs. So all these coefficients are just plus or minus one. All right, so that's my video on binomial series and the binomial theorem. If you have any questions or thoughts about the video, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.